Would you open it to our eyes and our hearts to go deeper in our walk with you? We just commit this time to you and we open our hearts to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're journeying through the book of Acts. And something that was uh, read in the passage you just heard is something that we've heard before. This title of these followers of Jesus, these early disciples. It's been mentioned before in Acts, and it's here again in verse 9. And then if you peek ahead, it's in chapter 19, verse 23. These early disciples, these people who were following Jesus, are called people of the way. Not a way, but the way. Because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And so these people of the way are following Jesus, who is really in action. That's what books, the, the book of Acts is about Jesus in action, continuing to build his kingdom and doing that his way, building his church his way with his people, his children who are called people of the way, followers of Jesus as the way. So today we really want to unpack this and consider some insights into what it can look like for us to be followers of Jesus and people of the way and be encouraged in our journey. That's what we're doing in the book of Acts. We're seeing these people that lived long ago that were following Jesus and how Jesus empowered them to be followers of, of Jesus and to be people of the way. And we learn from that and we're, we're encouraged in that because we are continuing to follow Jesus as he advances his kingdom and builds his church. And so we too could be called people of the way. And knowing that as we follow him, his power is unlimited to give us all that we need to do what he's calling us to do in following him and advancing the kingdom. You know, one of my, one of our favorite places, Chris, Chris and I love to meet our kids and our grandkids at this place called Crystal, Crystal Creek Falls, just above Whiskey Town Lake down there. It's really a cool place. And we just love just going there and watching the kids play, play in the water and just enjoying this, this waterfall, this beautiful waterfall that, you know, the water just cascading over the rocks and, and it just never stops flowing. And you can't really tell where it's coming from or where it's going, but it just never stops flowing. It always is continuing and it's so refreshing and so life-giving, especially on a hot day, to just enjoy his creation in, in places like that. The water and the beauty of it continuing to flow. Well, except for last time we were there, there was this little stagnant pool of water that, you know, just kind of sitting there, backwater and stuff in there that looked dead. I didn't want to put my foot in that. <laughs> but the water that was so beautiful to look at was the moving water. Precious and continuing to flow never stops, never stops working, never stops coming our direction, never ending in supply. And so Jesus, when he talked about in John 4, he spoke of this truly good living water that bubbles up to eternal life and never stops, never stops flowing, never stops working, never ending in the supply that God has for us. And by the way, it is a one-way flow never stops. We live in a world that is not really that different than the book of Acts and the culture that they were living in many ways. I mean, truth is relative. Pluralism is everywhere. You know, pick your own way. Uh, you know, whatever feels right to you, just do that. Listen, if, if there are many ways to heaven, let me put it this way, to think that there are many ways to get to heaven is as ridiculous as trying to make water flow uphill. There's only one way. Jesus came down and he went to a cross and was resurrected from the dead to make the way for us to have purpose and meaning and joy in real life. So he is the way. He just makes it simple and yet profound and deep. He is the way. So if we're following him, it's not a bad title. You probably wouldn't want to name your church this because it's so countercultural. But it, we are people of the way. 
Jesus came and he came to us. And when we come to him and we receive him and we open our hearts to him, then he fills us with living water that overflows to give us purpose and meaning in life, to bless other people as the source of life being in Jesus. And so the overflow of what God pours into us flows out into the lives of other people. So here, here's the first quality that I'd like to draw from this passage that we've already seen numerous times in Acts. You've heard this over and over again in our study of Acts. You know, because it fits our title too. We're either outpost. Over and over again, we're seeing these examples of people of the way, people that are following Jesus, children of God, living as public witness to the reality that Jesus is alive and building his church. So here, here's the first fill in the blank for you and you're, if you're following in the outline. People of the way. Here's a quality that we're learning from these early believers that we can embrace in our own life and walk out in the journey in which we walk. People of the way are spirit empowered to witness on the way and to do so in a, in a very winsome way. We'll get, that, to get to that in a moment, but we are spirit empowered. God calls us to be witnesses, but he would never call us to do anything for which he's not already empowered us and given everything we need to do it for his glory. He empowers us to be witnesses. We saw that in the first chapter of Acts, right? Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Acts 1.8 really could almost be a table of contents for the book of Acts. We've seen this power poured out for people to witness in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria. And now in the passage today, we are at the ends of the earth in that known world. The mission is going forth. People are empowered to witness for him. We are as well. We receive the power to be witnesses that Jesus is alive. And the more we share that, the more we walk as witnesses of Jesus, the more we live that out, the more we get to know him. Have you noticed that? You know, it's like when you give directions to somebody on how to get to a certain place, doesn't it make it more solid in your own mind on how to get there? It just kind of clarifies it. When, when you share with somebody else about, you know, your best friend and how much you like that person, doesn't it even take that friendship with that person a little deeper? I know when I, I get to share with people about how much I love my wife, it, you know, it just makes me love her even more. When we share with people how much we love Jesus, we're really getting to know him more, and it's going deeper, that relationship with him. And it comes off in, in a contagious, winsome way. It's just about our love for him. Because here's the thing. If God fills us up with living water, and it bubbles up to eternal life, and it overflows, and when we're taking living water from God and we're sharing that with other people, the more we share that living water with other people, the more God fills us up. Have you noticed that? All we need to do is turn on the tap and let God fill up the tank. Let the living water flow and come. It continues to come to us in never-ending supply. It never stops. His grace, his love, his glory, his magnificence never stops being poured out upon us. And by design, that's to overflow into the lives of other people. And that's being a witness to the truth that God is working in my life. So in Acts 19, the way for Paul takes him to this place, Ephesus. And in verses 2 and 3, Paul asks them if they received the Holy Spirit. When they, and they answered, no, we haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. You know, I, I just love the way that's written. I, I love the simplicity and the authenticity of the way they said that. They're just being real. I haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. So Paul takes them another step in their journey with Jesus. These people are already Christians because they're called disciples. They're called believers already. And nobody can be a believer and a follower of Jesus without the Holy Spirit initiating that. So they're already in some, in some sense believers, but they're not yet fully there in their control, being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, did you know that it's possible to be a believer in Jesus and not be full and fully controlled by the Holy Spirit? Maybe it's a little bit like having your feet in the water, but you haven't really drunk all that you can drink yet. There's a journey there. There's a process in that. And we don't create some kind of hierarchy, like, you know, I'm better than you because I'm further along than you. But the design of God, his invitation is for us to be filled, controlled by, 
immersed in the Holy Spirit of God, and he is the one empowering us to be witnesses of his glory. So note in this uh, verse 3, a couple of observations here. Paul is clearly assuming that they've already been baptized. We can see that in, in verse 3. Because everybody in the New Testament, if they followed Jesus and believed in Jesus, they were baptized as a way to witness that they've been saved and, and come to faith in Jesus. And we don't say that baptism is essential for salvation, but it's a really important act of obedience and submission. It's an empowering moment. It's a tremendous blessing when somebody puts their faith on public display and, and does something like a, a baptism in order to show that they are really in with Jesus. So they are people of the way. If they're believers in Jesus, they've been baptized. But also note that there's a distinction made here between John's baptism and that of Jesus. Did you notice that? There's a distinction made there between the two. John's preaching, John's baptism was really a baptism of repentance. Turn from your sin. Turn to Jesus. And so here we have this case in verse 5. They are baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And this is the only time in the New Testament where there's like a rebaptism. But there's something significant going on in this. It's a unique situation. It's, it's not the norm, if there is a norm. And don't miss the connection here between their baptism in this moment and a baptism in the Holy Spirit. A baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. So in verse 6, Paul placed his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came, and the Pentecost scene really is replayed in these moments. They spoke in tongues or languages. They prophesied. They spoke scripture and truth. A very similar experience to what happened in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem is now happening in this distant land. In Ephesus, they have this like Pentecost now for foreigners, those outside the city. So I don't pretend to know every detail about what's going on here in this passage, in this scene with these people in Acts 19, but there's a clear cultural context. There's a clear missional purpose to this. And we can note this, that not everybody who prays for the fullness of the Holy Spirit and enters into the Spirit-filled life not everybody that has that experience of the fullness of the Holy Spirit has the same thing show up or the same way that it happens, not in the book of Acts and, and not today. And so <coughs> this is a missional turning point moment. It's really an important moment. I, I like the way in, in, in verse 7, it says there's, there's 12 of them. I, I'm not prepared to say that, okay, now we have 12 apostles being appointed for the Gentiles. I don't think you can take it that far. But this is clearly an apostolic missional moment, like a Pentecostal moment for the Gentile world. Now, if, if you've been drifting or your mind off, went off on a tangent here for the last couple minutes, <laughs> come back, because this is really important. This is important to us as a church family. What's happening here in Acts, we need to understand it properly as deeply as we can understand it and make the proper application to it. I've encountered a lot of confusion in my years of ministry with scriptures like this. Maybe you have as well. Some people would explain it away. It's like, ah, you know, things like tongues and and prophecy, those, those just aren't for the day. Those, those things are just kind of weird. They're not for our time. And there's, there's others who would embrace the, the kind of theology that, well, yeah, if you, if you have an experience with the Holy Spirit and you prayed for the filling of the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Spirit, and what many call the baptism of the Spirit, which is what I think is the proper term for this ha happening in Acts 19, some people would say, okay, if you're experiencing the Holy Spirit and full of the Holy Spirit, then you will speak in tongues and you will prophesy. It's, it's like, they call it the evidence doctrine. It's the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Many of you come from one of those two, maybe, backgrounds, where you just kind of write it off and just don't talk about it because it's weird. Or 
You embrace it to the fullness and say, but if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will, these things will show up. And maybe if you're new to the outpost, you've already wondered, well, what do we believe? Where do we stand on all of that? Well, let me just say, we do not embrace either extreme. We want to have a middle ground. We want to embrace the middle ground of all that, not explain it away, but not say that it's the evidence of the Holy Spirit because there's greater evidence, I believe. Here's the thing. Why do we want to do that? Why do we pursue this, this middle ground? Because here's what we want as a church. Here, here's what I believe God has put as a vision on our church, our church family, to reach this community. I really believe we want to be spirit-empowered witnesses of Jesus in a way that's winsome, in a way that draws others in and not marginalizes anybody, and that puts anybody off by anything that they might think is, is strange. We intentionally want to create kind of a culture in our church worship services and, and even in, in our small groups. We want to intentionally create a culture that is welcoming to people that aren't even believers yet and welcoming to new believers and welcoming to anybody from whatever expression of faith they've experienced in the past. And so to do that, what we want to embrace really is Unity and love. Unity and love. So we want to be sensitive to each other and try to avoid doing anything that draws attention to me but puts all the attention on Jesus. That's what we're empowered to do. Be witnesses for Jesus. Now some of you are saying, well, of course. Some of you are, okay, I need to think about that some more and to process that a little bit more. But we want to be winsome. We want to pursue unity in love. And listen, I think that's God's heart too. And I think that's Paul's heart. Listen to what he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? Rhetorical questions really with the resonating answer being, of course not. You know, it would be kind of boring if we all had the same spiritual gift. And the fullness of the Holy Spirit showed up in the same way for all of us. I mean, that doesn't magnify the beauty of diversity in the kingdom of God. So the answer is, of, of course not. And then Paul goes into 1 Corinthians 13, which is known as the love chapter. So what's the point? Whatever spiritual gift we have, or whatever the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives... Our goal needs to be keeping the focus on Jesus and pursuing unity in love. Love. And so we love each other enough to be cautious and be winsome in the way that we express even the spirit-filled life. Unity in love. Which is, by the way, the first word in the list of what's written as the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. Listen to this, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and I think this is the greater evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I think this is the tremendous evidence, the most powerful evidence that the Holy Spirit of God is making Jesus real to me and enabling me to be an empowered witness for him when these things show up, no matter what the circumstance is, that's evidence of the Spirit in our lives, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit shows up in our lives. And note in, verse, in Acts 19, where we've been reading this morning, Paul's in Ephesus, and he later writes to these believers who experienced this filling of the Spirit that we've read today. He writes to them later in Ephesians. He says, be filled with with the Spirit. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. That's an invitation. It's a command. It's a very real thing to be fully filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I look, like to look at the, I don't know if you've ever seen the message version. It's kind of a modern English kind of translation. I like the way the message puts Ephesians 5.18. Don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God. Huge drinks. Drink freely of the Spirit of God. 
And when we do, we're empowered to witness love and joy and peace and things that point the way to others, to Jesus. You know, I used to picture that whole thing of being filled with the Spirit and being consumed with the Spirit and being immersed with the Spirit. I used to picture that as like a cup. You know, I fill my cup. And I keep filling my cup, you know, because we leak. So we'd be being filled with the Spirit. We keep being filled with the Spirit all the time. As he's writing to them, he's aware that they've had an experience. But we leak, and so we need to keep being filled with the Spirit. It's a be being filled. And I used to think, you know, it's like fill up the cup and it overflows. And then I impact other people. With, with blessing. And then my mind kind of shifted to a cup, not just being filled and overflowing, but being immersed fully in God's river of life. I throw my whole cup in. I'm totally consumed, surrounded, and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. I, I like that image. If you take any image too far, it can, it can break down because, you know, we can you know quickly lose any sense of purpose or identity in ourselves and just float through life if we're not careful with an image like that. I, I like the image that I heard from our president, John Stumble, the president of the CNMA. Some of you might, might have watched his video. He, he talked about how he used to think it was like a bucket dipped down into a well and you fill it up and drink and then you go down into the well and drink some more and you just keep doing that, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he, he talked about a vision he had where that bucket got turned on its side. You know, the bottom fell out and the bucket got turned on its side and then he sees himself, and I like this image, we're not just a bucket overflowing with the Holy Spirit of God. We're not just a bucket sitting in the well being immersed or sitting my bucket in the middle of the river or the stream. Turn it sideways in humility and it'll be a conduit <coughs> that we're open to the Holy Spirit flowing through me to minister to other people. That's an empowering image to me. And when I do that, it, it makes me look like a conduit that's more and more like Jesus, allowing the Spirit of God to work in me and through me to bring life to others. Because here, here's the problem that we can encounter with things like uh, tongues and prophecies, especially because they're so visible. We can encounter the problem that sometimes they can be and may be and often have been off track, sometimes abused. Doesn't mean we should write them off or discount them. Of course not. They're gifts of the Spirit. We believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today. But if we pray for someone, for example, who doesn't understand what we're praying, there, it could be that they're not really built up, nor does it glorify God. We want to have understanding. I have friends that have a gift of tongues, and it's a beautiful thing. I'd love to be around with somebody that prays in a tongue. For me, that builds me up because it's musical and I love it. It just tunes me in. But if there's somebody in our midst that doesn't get built up by that, it's more turned away by that, then we want to be sensitive and loving and pursue unity in love. I, I hope you're hearing my heart in this as we think about a church that's moving forward and wanting to make an impact in the community. I've also heard people say things like regarding prophecy, it's like, God told me to tell you. God told me to tell you, and then it gets told. Or, I have a prophecy for you. And maybe they do. We don't want to discount that. But the problem with that approach is the me and the I. There's a more winsome way. There's a more winsome way. If God has a word for somebody else and he wants to use your voice to communicate it, just share it. We don't have to label it to what it is. Let the person receiving it discern. That's being a conduit and taking yourself out of the picture and not putting the focus on me or my bucket. You know, there are a number of you in the room who God has spoken to me, even prophetically, through your vocal cords. There are a number of you in the room that God has spoken to me, and I would say prophetically, through things that you've written to me or emails you've sent. You might not even know it. But I identified it. I recognized it. You gave me the, the freedom to discern that, oh, they didn't have to say, this is from God. I knew this was from God. Took you out of the picture. God's get the God gets the glory, and you are a conduit. So listen, I, I believe tongues is for today, properly expressed in a winsome way. I believe prophecy is still for today. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, don't treat prophecies with contempt. 
But let's be encouraged to be winsome and pursue unity in love and give God the glory in it. Because people of the way are spirit empowered to be able to witness on this journey we're on in a winsome way that draws others in, not in a way that draws attention to me, but all the attention on God and his glory, all the attention on Jesus. And doesn't marginalize anyone, but pursues unity in love. And here's another principle in that that I think is really important to embrace out of this passage this morning. The people of the way are aware of something significant in all of this. We're in a battle. We're in a war. And there are counterfeits and things that can get us off track. People of the way are empowered army of God, advancing the kingdom of God. Some of you are in the middle of a battle or coming out of one. And so you, you can really relate to this. And it's hard. It's exhausting. Sometimes it's taxing on our emotions. People of the way, no matter what we're encountering, no matter what we're facing, we just keep taking steps of faith. Just keep walking. It's a journey. It's a way. Will Rogers said, even if, you know who Will Rogers is? Will Rogers said, isn't he the guy that had the little guy and the little thing in the back of the stagecoach? It's all right. I don't know. Will Rogers, anyway, he said, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. <laughs> we're going to keep moving. No matter what we're encountering, we're just keep taking steps of faith. You know, even if we're in the hospital, every army has a good hospital wing, and some of you might be in the hospital. Some of you might be home right now because you're sick and you're not feeling well. And sometimes we need the hospital and we as a church need to have a hospital wing where we're just ministering to each other. We have no expectations of each other. And we just encourage each other to stay in the race. But there comes that point. The whole point of the hospital is to get back in the war. The spiritual war. The war of this clash of kingdoms. Because Jesus is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail in the advance of his kingdom, and the invitation is for us to be involved with that. We're all, even if we're sick, even if we're in a hospital, even if we're on the front lines and just doing warfare and understanding that we're in the middle of the battle, we're all in the courtroom of life where Jesus is consistently always being put on trial. And he's put on trial through us. So we need to stay in, stay faithful, stay in the battle and realize it's the empowering of God by his spirit that will enable us to keep taking the next step of faith. The battle is constant. That means the enemy is not people, but the spirits in the kingdom of darkness. It's a clash of kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And there's this clash of kingdoms going on all the time around us. It's not that people are the enemy, but they get caught up in the darkness and their enemy's tools. So in verses 9 and 10 in the passage we read, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe. They opposed the way. Yet Paul kept on going. Kept on working as a soldier of the king. And it says in verse 11, because he was willing to just keep being a tool in the hands of God, it says that God did miracles through Paul. I think that's significant language. It's not just that Paul did miracles. God did miracles through Paul. And it really points an accent mark to the fact that Jesus is at work here in the, in the background. This miracle that you see with the cloak and the touching of the handkerchief, that's an identical miracle to what Jesus was doing in the Gospels. It just accents the point that what they're doing, they're doing these miracles. God's doing them through them. And it's pointing to Jesus being the one doing it by his spirit. People are getting healed. The kingdom is advancing. You know, check out the digging deeper if you'd like to take that deeper. There's some verses there in the book of Mark that show some of the miracles that Jesus did that really Paul's doing it. You can just tell that this is the fingerprints of Jesus at work. And by the way, everything we do and pray should be in his name. In the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is powerful. The name of Jesus is mighty. I, can, I shared my testimony before of being sick with malaria and feeling like I was going to die. And I was so confused and so overwhelmed by fever that the only thing I could think of was the name of Jesus. And that's all I could say. It was Jesus. Jesus. 
And just in proclaiming the name of Jesus and crying out to him, I experienced some healing. My wife, Chris, when she got, when she got dengue fever, we prayed over her early on. They recognized it as dengue fever, and we gathered some people around her and put hands on her and prayed for her in Jesus' name. And then we sang this really old chorus about the power of the name of, of Jesus, Jesus' name above all names. And in that moment, in the name of Jesus, she was healed. Yes, I believe God still heals. I've experienced it. He can do amazing, marvelous things. He doesn't always choose. It's whatever brings him the most glory, but he still does heal. And we should always be thinking in terms of when we pray for people and when we believe. It's all about the name of Jesus and the powerful name of Jesus. When you're in a battle and you're recognizing that you're really wanting to be a soldier of the king, if you know him and you believe him and you're his child, his name is meaningful and powerful. Unless you don't know him. Read on in this story. I want to pick up a couple of verses in Acts 19, verses 13 through 17. If you have your Bible, look at these words that really express something that's important that we dare not miss. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, verse 13, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the, name of the in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, the, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And one day the evil spirits answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Yes, the name of Jesus is powerful, even in people who don't know him. But they were... You know, they were holding something and using something for the wrong motive and the wrong purpose, and they didn't know him, and it exploded on them. And they were not bleeding. But it says in the next verse, when this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. If we know him and believe in him and we're his children and filled with his spirit, the name of Jesus is meaningful. We hold it in high honor. It's powerful. And we just don't use it as a tool, but we know that that is the weapon of our warfare. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. So we are an empowered people of the way. And sometimes we get disrupted. Sometimes we face a battle. If you read on in Acts chapter 19, I won't, I won't read it, but if, read it on your own time. There's this, this discussion about this riot that happens in, in Ephesus in the remainder of chapter 19. And people get really disturbed about this group called the Way. And there's this riot that comes forth. But, you know, the point for us is that people still get disturbed when they find out that we're people of the Way. That's really exclusive. Well, Jesus said that. We believe that. The powerful name of Jesus is the only way to find a relationship with God and to find hope and help and purpose and meaning. We are an empowered army. And the name of Jesus is the name of our king. And he is advancing his kingdom and doing it through you and me, us together as an empowered army, as we follow and as we obey and as we submit to his leadership or, or yield to his directions, his leading in our lives. So that's, that's the final quality I'd like to point to that we're seeing in the book of Acts. These people are yielding to the directions and the leadership of Jesus and being empowered in the spirit to be witnesses for him. And for us, when people of the way yield to God, he's the one that builds encouragement. He's the one that gives courage to speak for him and, and witness for him, even in the face of opposition. When we yield to him and submit to him, you know, there's two meanings of the word yield. Yield, first of all, means to surrender, to submit, to stop resisting. And there's another meaning of the word yield, right? To produce a crop. A farmer would know this. Good yield this year is to produce a crop or a profit. In Christ, both of those come together. We submit to him, we yield to him, and he produces the fruit. He brings forth the love and the joy and the peace, and it's to his glory. That's the stuff of, of living water. 
submitting to him, as James said, submit, yield to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Ours is the victory in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Yielding means we acknowledge what the prophet said. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. So a summarizing acronym, if, if you will. People of the way. People of the way, there, there's three big things that we've looked at this morning that really come out of the book of Acts as a whole. People of the way are constantly thinking about their witness. This choice, this word I'm about to say, is it a witness to Jesus and his powerful message? We're serious about being a witness. We're empowered to advance the kingdom. We've already won, and Jesus is at work. We're just invited to join in and be his tools, his instruments, his conduit to speak words of life into the hearts of other people. And that happens as we yield and submit to him as our commander-in-chief, our leader, our God, our king. That's what it looks like to be a person of the way. We witness, we advance the kingdom, we yield always to him. We're always submitting to his leadership and his empowering in our lives. So just to paint a little picture, what, the picture that came to mind for me this week was memories of floating on the Blackfoot River up in Montana when we lived up there. We did it a bunch. You know, I had a friend with a raft and we would go floating on the, the Blackfoot River, gorgeous place. I'm looking forward to floating on the Trinity River. I'm sure it's equally or even more beautiful. But I remember memories of being on this enjoyable float trip down the Blackfoot River and the, the, just the thrill of that journey and the, the wonder of it all, just taking it all in. And I remember sometimes I would think, you know, I wish so-and-so was here in the raft with us. Or sometimes I would see somebody on the bank and it's like they look bored. <laughs> Man, I wish they were here having fun with us. It's such an incredible journey. Now, if you've ever been rafting, it's not all fun and games, right? You can hit a rock and fall out of the boat. You can get into a whirlpool or a backwater and get kind of stuck behind some big rocks. You can hit a log jam. The mosquitoes bite. You can get sunburned. It's not all fun and games. There's a battle to it. Sometimes you've got to put every ounce of energy you have into the oars to avoid something in the river. But oh, the thrill of the journey if Jesus is manning the oars <laughs> and empowering us to enjoy the ride with him and him being in control. If we could see the outpost as, as like a life raft in that way, the invitation for us is yeah, to enjoy the journey with Jesus, to know that there's obstacles and there are things that are hard. It, it is a spiritual war, but to know that he's in control, he will get us, we're gonna keep floating, in this river that's going, you know, that's it's moving, and we're a part of it, but we are called to rescue people. We're called to rescue people who might be washed up on a sandbar, or sitting on the, the bank, getting drunk or high on something that will never satisfy, or stuck in a log jam, or in a whirlpool. We're called to rescue people and get them on the life raft that Jesus has given us to pursue for missional involvement in our community. And there's plenty of room on this life raft and we are empowered to draw people in as we pursue unity and love and be winsome in the way that we minister to our community to see that others will see the power of Jesus in our lives. That's our calling, that's our purpose, that's our mission, to reach others in Trinity County, to draw them into faith in Jesus. And when we are doing that, when we are witnessing and we're experiencing his power to do so in a way that draws others in, we are right in the center of the current of God's redemptive flow. It's going somewhere. There's a beautiful journey ahead. And we want to get everybody we can on board. So a couple of questions to help us to maybe apply this and, and live this out. Let me ask, first of all, do you consider yourself to be a person of the way? Maybe you've been distracted and confused by all the other opinions and all the other ways that people say, hey, you can have a relationship with God this way. And, you know, these other religions are valid. There's lots of ways to get to heaven. Maybe that's you. Maybe you haven't come to the point of realizing that you know, God went to extreme measures to make the way possible. And there's only that way. If, if there's any other way than the cross, 
Don't you think God would have pursued that other way? The only way is the cross. And Jesus taking our place that we can have access to the way. The way to real life through forgiveness and cleansing and coming out of the tomb as Jesus modeled into new life empowered by him to make a difference in our world. So do you consider yourself to be a person of the way? I hope you're on some kind of a journey if you haven't yet and maybe you're ready even today to say, hey, I wanna climb on board. Plenty of room. This is a life raft that's going somewhere with purpose and meaning. And boy, I, I enjoy talking to other people about how much I love the people at the outpost. You know, when I have opportunity in our community, I, I just love to say, the people are amazing. You want to enjoy life, you know, get to know some of these amazing people that I get to fellowship with and worship with and live the spirit-filled life together with in our community. Man, come on. Come on board. If that's you, if you're ready to receive Jesus as your way and your salvation and, and invite him, it's all just about opening our hearts to him turning away from the, the other ways and turning fully to him and being immersed in him and control, surrender to him. Boy, give us a call, send us an email, grab somebody after the service and just ask for prayer. We love to pray for people to enter into this beautiful relationship with Jesus. And let me ask, are you living the spirit-filled life? Maybe some of this conversation is new to you. This whole thing of tongues and prophecy and being filled with the Spirit, that might be brand new to you. It's an adventurous life that we're empowered for by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who makes Jesus real to us and enables us to make him real to others. It's the Spirit-filled life. You know, Luke wrote in his gospel, Luke who also wrote the book of Acts that we're reading, he wrote in Luke eleven thirteen 13 of his gospel, the context of prayer, how much more Will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If you've never done so, go home today, or wherever you are right now. Ask, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to be all in. I want to surrender to you. I want this Spirit-filled life. If, you, if you'd like somebody to pray with you on that, we would delight in praying for you to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit that you can experience his joy, his love, his peace, his patience, his kindness, his goodness. All of it would show up in your life. Just ask. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word that is so alive and active and you use it to guide us and to teach us and to show us your way. Lord, help us to understand, help us to apply, empower us to live it out in a contagious way for your glory and that others would be drawn in. God, fill us up. Fill us up to overflowing. Enable us to be that conduit where you are flowing directly through us to minister to other people. And we're so thankful for the joy that that brings, that we are like a tool in your hands to bless others. God, fill us up, flow through us to minister to others for your glory. We ask for that, Lord. We ask for a filling of the Spirit, even as a church, that you would fill us with your Spirit and enable us to live Jesus in a way that's contagious. God, empower us for it. Fill us up and, and help our lives to just sing for you, to declare how great you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Could you please stand as we close out?